Hello and good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to this One Young World 2022 delegate session. I am Nimko Ali, um, ambassador for One Young World and the CEO and the co-founder of the Five Foundation, the global um, partnership to end FGM. And I'm joined by the incredible Edna Arden, the founder and CEO of Edna University and also Edna Foundation. Um, so we're here today to talk about female genital mutilation and how to um, work towards ending that. First of all, Edna, thank you very much for taking the time um, to be with us today. And I think it's going to be an incredible session for us to learn from the pioneer um, of this whole movement upon some of us are all working on at the moment. So can I just give, um, just hand, hand over to you to introduce yourself? Well, thank you very much. It's uh, it's such a pleasure to, to join you. And uh, it's a, it's a privilege to have the world join hands to try and fight this terrible tradition that we have been fighting for over half a century. I'm a nurse, I'm a midwife. And as you can imagine, I go to work in the morning uh, or in the middle of the night when they call me and I have to get a baby out. I'm trying to deliver a baby um, and helping a woman who has undergone female genital mutilation. And this is never an easy thing because what God had created, uh, the anatomy of the woman uh, is so damaged and so mutilated that when it comes to the time of bearing children, the damage then affects the newborn baby because it delays the birth of the child. So not only is female genital mutilation or female circumcision, whatever you call it. Um, it's a mutilation of, of the woman's reproductive organs, external reproductive organs. And we have to be practical. We have to call a spade a spade and describe what it does. Um, so not only is it a damage to the woman's uh, childbearing functions, but it also affects the, the, the babies that this woman is trying to put to the world. It's frustrating. It's, it brings to the surface my own experience with this, my own life experience with this. And I was so frustrated by this and so uh, emotionally um, um, concerned and, and as a professional, as a woman, that about 50 years ago, I, I couldn't hold it in and started a fight to speak about female genital mutilation in public um, and since then we've been uh, uh, we've had so many wonderful people on board uh, institutions and organizations the united nations unicef unfpa wh of course my parent organization that i served for many years and over the years we've had resolutions fine resolutions are good the world comes together and says let's have a resolution about this um, harmful practice uh, a resolution that condemns it, uh, makes it uh, illegal. Um, but the resolutions are good, okay, but it's on paper. Mm. What happens to the woman, to the child in a village, somewhere in a developing country, where people have not read about this resolution, do not know about this resolution, um, are not affected by it, uh, and still go on, practicing this centuries old tradition to cut little girls. And that's where the world needs to join hands now. And that's when people like young ambassadors, like Nimco and so many others now who are joining this campaign uh, can contribute to, is to raise awareness, not only internationally, which is good, that's already done. There are resolutions out there but in the countries, in the 30 or so countries where this practice takes place. Go down to the ground roots, go down to the villages, talk to the women, talk to the grandmothers, because at the end of the day, it's the grandmothers who decide what's going to happen to the granddaughters, what's going to make them more marriageable, what's going to make them more accepted into society, what's going to make them, quote and unquote, purified for marriage because they believe that this is purification which of course it is not i'm joining you where i'm proud to say that for the first time 
in the 50 years that we've been fighting this, I have a government behind this campaign. I have a president who does not condone it. I have a parliament that discusses it. And we also have religious leaders who have enacted a fatwa to denounce female infibulation. I think having men involved in this conversation from the position of um, power. So I think legislation is fundamental to helping to end FGM. And then the second thing is that grassroots um, conversation because the Five Foundation is fundamentally committed to funding African women on the African continent who know what they're doing. Can you tell me the importance of what it was like to be a Somali woman going to the UN and fighting to have FGM like, you know, taken as a serious issue? Well, we did that in 79. Well, yeah, you did that, yeah. We did that. We picketed the United Nations, uh, number one, UN Plaza. Uh, we carried boards, and that's what resulted in having the resolutions put out by heads of states. But then it's not going to change. If you ha We have resolutions. We have, For instance, we had when I was with the UN in WHO in, in Djibouti, uh, we had the uh, law number 555, 5 May 1995, and we felt, we thought that by having a law, this was going to put FGM, bring it to end. But it's, it's not a resolution on a paper mm. that, that brings it to an end. It's what people do. It's how we can enforce that law. And you cannot enforce a law unless you have a mechanism to do so. You cannot put in prison every grandmother and every mother in the world. In, in the countries where it's done. So we need to convince them. And of course, you've touched on a very important point. We must involve the fathers mm -hmm. because this little girl who's been cut up so, so, so you know, uh, badly for marriageability has a father and father must have a say in it. And very often the father is enlightened. The father is educated. And he should take his role and responsibility as, a, as the head of that family to say, no, my daughter will not be damaged. My daughter will not be cut. My daughter's life will not be put in danger. What have we done since we opened the Edna Allen Hospital 20 years ago in 2002? And since that time, we have included FGM in all the curriculum or the curricula of training nurses, midwives, health professionals. If you're gonna be a dentist, you're going to learn about FGM. And you're going to say, oh, but this is, you know, I don't work in that part of the body. Tough luck. You're a health professional and you should know what damages FGM does. So all health professionals are taught and required to, uh, to abide by the fatwa, by the regulations of the Ministry of Health of our countries. Um, we also uh, go to universities. So there are 41 universities in Somaliland. And there are thousands, tens of thousands of young people in academic courses. They're not, they, they, they know about the world. They know about regulations. And they're the parents of tomorrow. So we educate them, we counsel them, we inform them about the harmful, harmful effect of FGM, the dangers of FGM. Do you think... Um Sorry, I was going to say, do you think COVID has had a setback in that conversation in terms of um, seeing the, the wins against FGM being lost because of COVID? Oh, COVID has gained many things because we have not been able to travel. Yeah. We had little resources. Our energies were focused on saving lives, on acute situations in, 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 in uh, uh, you know, acute care and, and patients who were dying. So yes, it has affected and people have said, okay, the, the, you know, this is something that we will do because there's nobody here to tell us otherwise. So we need to pick up where we left off. Where we left off. Um, and then of course, other, other things that COVID has uh, given advantage to is um, HIV AIDS. Mm. Uh, you know, the campaigns against HIV has, has, has diminished because all the attention and all the effort was focused on, on, on COVID. So there are many things that, that need to be picked up. And, and most important of all, FGM. 
And one of the things that I really want to kind of, I think we're touching on the grass, it's about funding. So I'm very much in that. So we know, actually, if you just said um, um, HIV, so comparative study shows that HIV AIDS gets um, $700 per individual impacted. When it comes to the expenditure on FGM, it's, 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 it's less than a US dollar. So for me, it's about how do we scale that funding up? And are you of the same mindset that I am, that it's not about funding, again, these people that pass the resolutions, but f- funding the women on the ground that are doing the work and organizations like yours who are on the front line? Absolutely. Well, for the past 50 years that I have been fighting FGM, uh, we have never been funded to fight FGM in Somaliland, in the mm. country. I've been invited to attend conferences. I was in Beijing. I was in uh, uh, Copenhagen during the Mid-Decade Conference for Women. I was in New York. I was in, I was in every capital of the world. But do you think we would find a fraction of those resources to carry out ground roots, ground, you know, ground work on, on, on the ground in the villages? No, we don't get funding because that's not glamorous enough. Uh, educating village people is not glamorous enough, but inviting us to go to conferences and, and, and say, so-and-so is gonna be speaking there, people have funds for that. So I, I would like to invite the world to spend, well, thank you for whatever assistance they have given us so far, we're grateful for it. I must not look a gift horse in the mouth because we wouldn't be where we are today without international support. But I think we need to go back to the drawing board and rethink where your resources would be most effective. And that would be in the countries where the practice is taking place. That would be saving lives, not raising awareness about people who are already aware about it and horrified by it and don't damage their children, but actually go down and speak in the languages that these people speak, the vernacular languages, the dialects that are spoken in all the different countries and regions of Africa. And if you come to the Horn of Africa, my little corner of the world, think of all the languages that are spoken. Start, let's start the Horn from, let's say, from Eritrea, Ethiopia, Djibouti, Somaliland, Somalia, Kenya, Uganda, Tanzania. Just, just take that little horn until the base of the horn. You may even go up to Sudan or South Sudan. There are hundreds of different languages spoken. But medical health professionals have the same aim mm. to save lives. And that is why we have developed in Somaliland a small booklet that I would be very happy to share with you in Somali, classical Somali. So. 22 million Somali-speaking people of the Horn of Africa can benefit from it with with their different dialect variations, but they can understand the classical Somali. And we've translated it into English, so it can be retranslated into other languages. We're working on the French version, and we're working on the Arabic version. We're self-funding. I was going to say this is so. This, so this is the problem: is the fact that there are a lot of people that want to pretend that they're trying to work on ending FGM, but they're not funding Black African women to do the, to do the work. And there will be people that are listening. And I have, in the last like you know three four years since we've been doing the Five Foundation, well, since, since the last two years since we've been doing the Five Foundation, I think the more a Black woman stands in her power, the more pushback she gets. Um, and also that's where you have to do this, this kind of self-funding. So I just wanted to kind of ask, coming back to the fact that you're self-funding this incredible work, what has it been like for you to be the leading voice, but as a Black woman and as an African woman that's proud of that um, identity? Well, I'm proud that our, our little voice, our small voice, that was just a little whisper 50 years ago, where people knew nothing about FGM, now are speaking about FGM, the fact that we're zooming about FGM in itself and we're zooming to the world uh, in itself shows that our voice has been heard. Uh, When I spoke in the uh, Women's Congress in in Beijing uh, in 1995, in the Women's Congress, people were horrified because they hadn't heard about it. But that was such a long time ago. We We need to have, we should have moved forward beyond where we were 30, 40, 50 years ago, little girls should no longer be cut. 
Little girls should no longer be damaged, but they are. So whatever we're doing needs to be done even more forcefully, needs to be done more widely, needs to be done in a more concerted effort, needs to be done respectfully. Because very often, non uh, people from countries where the practice does not take place will refer to it as a barbaric African issue. It is not barbaric. It's an old tradition. How many countries uh, can you list who have never had a harmful traditional practice? But can we say that? Because I find, I think that's that's the kind of the language of the global north and the south. That's where they they forget, that they, they don't know how to communicate. I think if we call it a human right violation, I say to people that there is not a work, there is not a country in the world where rape is not a reality, where other forms of child abuse is it's, 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 it's not a reality, but there is a tangibility of ending FGM if we support Black African women. And I think that's something that, that is consistently missed about the people who keep using these languages of traditional practice, barbaric. It, it's more from an anthropological kind of insight as to really seeing the humanity of Black and African women. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes, and, and also it's, it's damaging to our identity because we have beautiful, wonderful practices in Africa that we're very proud of. This is a harmful practice that we're trying to eradicate, but we have so many other cultural um, and, and, and historical traditions that we are so proud of. Um, so when people lump it all together as a harmful barbaric African practice, the, uh, it creates a negative effect. Mm. It closes, shuts down the barrier. It, it stops the people we're trying to convince from listening to us, from listening to reason, from listening to a harmful physical damage that it does. Every grandmother knows what bleeding is, what yeah. pain is, what infection is. And if we just stick to the medical harmful damage Death, everybody knows death and how many children have died because of FGM, because of infection resulting from FGM or, or hemorrhage resulting from you know, blood vessels being so badly damaged that the child bleeds to death. And how many people cannot relate to the fact that when a woman cannot bring a child to, to come out in, 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 the, in, in, in the normal birth time, the delay of that child from coming out causes damage to this baby. We need to do it in a way that does not offend the parents because at the end of the day, mothers and grandmothers think they're doing the right thing for their daughters. So we need, like, uh, let's say 40, 50 years ago when vaccines were invented, parents used to hide their children from us because they believed that vaccines were gonna kill their children. We're gonna infect them with diseases. Um, And they would would cry and, 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 and cling to the children to stop us from, from giving the, 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 the vaccination. So it's the same kind of education and expanded education, counseling, convincing. We have to convince parents so they become people who then respect the regulations that come with it. One of the things I want to say to you and I'm quite hopeful about is, do you think we're well likely to get legislation passed in Somaliland anytime soon? Legislation could be passed. It won't take that long to, to pass legislation, but will you be able to enact it and enforce it? That, that, that's what we, that's, that's the, what, you know, the bottom line. You know, it's easy to pass a law. And there are many women's organizations and health uh, organizations and the, 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 you know, the midwives association is against, the, the medical association is against FGM. We're all against FGM. And I know we can convince the government and the parliament, there's a new young educated parliament uh, elected last year in Somaliland. I know we can pass it, but will we be able to enforce it? So I think before we, we, we focus on the law, we, we do a parallel massive uh, education of the, of, of the people mm. so that when the law comes, they respect it and they will, be, they will abide by it. So, um, the, you know, w- another thing I, I you know, I, I thought I would r- remind the world is that in 1947, the very first law against FGM was passed in the Sudan. Mm. 
1947. There has never, there's never been since that time one single person taken to court. So the law was there. Yeah. It just gives the people you know, a sense of complacency. Oh, now we've done it. Okay, we have a law. Let the law take care of it. The law will not take care of it. The law will not go and catch the, you know, every mother in her geisa and every grandmother in her geisa in jail. I get a lot of pushback. Um, I need... And it'd be nice, actually, for you, for for somebody that's in Africa that's like you know led on this conversation to be um, able to push back on this. What do you say to Somalis that have a go at activists like me who want girls to be protected? Well, surprise, surprise! When I talk to the communities in the United Kingdom, they listen to me because I sit down with them and I talk to them and I convince them and I I convince them with respect. They trust me. I'm I'm 84. I've been talking about this for 50 years. We've been through thick and thick together. We've been through civil wars together. We've, you know, many of them I deliver their mothers or their, their, their you know, their, you know, their, their aunts. They know me, and I, I, I sit with them and I talk to them and they listen to me. And not only not so long ago, I was invited by the NHS in, in, in London and I was talking to women exactly about FGM. So it's it's how the educator educates the, the community that you wish to educate. Um, you know, yes, it's child abuse. Yes, it's, you know, uh, gender comes into it. Yes, race comes into it. All of this, each one of them is important in itself. And I just focus on the health. And that's with the listen to. And when I talk about FGM, I talk about it as a health issue. And I said, we're going to talk about health issues that are going to affect our health the health of our women and the health of our children. So they, they think I'm going to talk about a new disease or a new problem, and they come to me. But if I say uh, on Tuesday I'm going to be talking about FGM, nobody will show up. So it's, it's how you approach it. It's how you, you address them. And it's learning to be humble enough to accept small gains. The days when I expected them to win a big battle is over. I'm happy for every little child, every little girl who is saved. So let us be grateful for the small gains and aim for bigger gains. It's been in- incredibly um, powerful to listen to you. And, and honestly, the, I would not be doing the work that I'm doing today if, if it wasn't for you for laying that foundation and for having those conversations. And I think the reason that both of us has had this kind of um, strong sense of feeling in order to be able to end FGM because it's something that we personally understand and yet standing here as survivors but not as people that were broken from the act of violence that happened to us I think that's a testament to um, the resilience of African women. Mm-hmm. Oh, so many things have happened to us I mean, I'm, I'm from Somaliland I've, I've we've known civil war we've we've known genocide we've known you know, I, I've been a political prisoner as a former first lady. I was under house arrest. I was a political, you know, the communist regime of, of Somalia has done perpetrated, F, perpetrated every act of, of, of horror and, and against the people of Somaliland. And we've survived that. And we will continue to fight FGM because we must. We have no option other than to, to fight it with, with respect, with dignity, um, and, um, and with determination. Thank you very much. Honestly, it's been it's been incredible. And I hope the audience has really um, got a lot out of this. And ultimately, I hope I hope what they get out of it is the ability to understand that those of you that have um, the means to be able to help fundraise and fund. Like, you know, there's um, Edna's Hospital is 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 one of our partners and we're massively committed to getting women um, funding directly. So if you have means, please direct them towards Edna or ourselves and we're more than happy to help. And there's the Edna Hospital Foundation UK, by the way. Okay, there you go. Again, so if you are willing to donate and there's the ability to donate, um, Edna's Foundation, what is Edna Hospital Foundation UK? Great. Thank you.